Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 1 Old Man of the Hills. A girl in crumpled linen slacks skidded to a fast stop on the polished floor of the Star Business Office. With a flourish, she pushed a slip of paper through the bars of the treasurer's cage. She grinned beguilingly at the man, who was totaling a long column of figures. "'Top of the morning, Mr. Peters,' she chirped. "'How about cashing a little check for me?' The bald-headed, tired-looking man peered carefully at the crisp rectangle of paper. Regretfully, he shook his head. "'Sorry, Miss Parker. I'd like to do it, but orders are orders. Your father said I wasn't to pass out a penny without his okay. "'But I'm stony broke. I'm destitute.' The blue eyes became eloquent, pleading. "'My allowance doesn't come due for another ten days.' why not talk it over with your father penny retrieved the check and tore it to bits i've already worked on dad until i'm blue in the face she grumbled talking to a mountain gives one a lot more satisfaction now you know your father gives you almost everything you want the treasurer teased you have a car of your own and no gas to run it penny cut in I work like a galley slave, helping Dad build up the circulation of this newspaper. You have brought the star many new subscribers, Mr. Peters agreed warmly. I'll always remember that fine story you wrote about the vanishing houseboat mystery. It was one of the best this paper ever published. What's the use of being the talented, only daughter of a prosperous newspaper owner if you can't cash in on it now and then, Penny went on. Why, the coffers of this old paper fairly drip gold, but do I ever get any of it? I'll let you have a few dollars, Mr. Peters offered unexpectedly. Enough to tide you over till the day your allowance falls due. You see, I know how it is because I have a daughter of my own. Penny's chubby, freckled face brightened. Then the light faded. She asked doubtfully, You don't intend to give me money out of your own pocket, Mr. Peters? why yes i wouldn't dare go against your father's orders penny he said no more of your checks were to be cashed without his approval unfolding several crisp new bills from his wallet the treasurer offered them to penny she gazed at the money with deep longing then firmly pushed it back thanks mr peters but it has to be dad's money or none you see i have a strict code of honor sorry replied the treasurer I'd like to help you. Oh, I'll struggle on somehow. With a deep sigh, Penny turned away from the cage. She was a slim, blue-eyed girl whose enthusiasms often carried her into trouble. Her mother was dead, but though she had been raised by Mrs. Weems, a faithful housekeeper, she was not in the least spoiled. Nevertheless, because her father, Anthony Parker, publisher of the Riverview Star, was indulgent, she usually had her way about most matters. From him, she had learned many details of the newspaper business. In fact, having a flair for reporting, she had written many of the paper's finest stories. Penny was a friendly, lovable little person. Not for long could she remain downhearted. As she walked down the long hallway, its great expanse of polished floor suddenly looked as inviting as an ice pond. With a quick little run, she slid its length, and at the elevator corner she collided full tilt with a bent old man who hobbled along on a crooked hickory cane. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Penny apologized. I didn't know anyone was coming. I uh, shouldn't have taken this hall on high. The unexpected collision had winded the old man. He staggered a step backwards, and Penny grasped his arm to offer support. She could not fail to stare. Never before in the star office had she seen such a queer-looking old fellow. He wore loose-fitting, coarse garments with heavy boots. His hair, snow-white, had not been cut in many weeks. 
The grotesque effect was heightened by a straw hat, several sizes too small, which was perched atop his head. I'm sorry, Penny repeated. I guess I didn't know where I was going. Pears like we're in the same boat, miss, replied the old man in a cracked voice. Lows as how I don't know where I'm a-going myself. Then perhaps I can help you. Are you looking for someone in this building? The old man took a grimy sheet of paper from a tattered coat pocket. I want to find a feller who will print this advertisement for me, he explained carefully. I want everybody who takes the newspaper to read it. I got cash money to pay for it, too. He drew a greasy bill from an ancient wallet and waved it proudly before Penny. You see, miss, I got cash money. I ain't no moocher. Penny hid a smile. Not only did the old man look queer, but his conversation was equally quaint. She thought that he must come from an isolated hill community many miles distant. I'll show you the way to the ad department, she offered, guiding him down the hall. I see you have your advertisement written out. Yes, miss. The old man hobbled along beside her. My old woman wrote it all down. She was well educated before we got hitched. Proudly, he offered Penny the paper, which bore several lines of neatly inscribed script. The advertisement, long and awkwardly worded, offered for sale an old spinning wheel, an ancient loom, and a set of wool carters. My old woman used to be one of the best weavers in Hobostein County, the old man explained with pride. She could make a man a pair of jeans that wear like they had grown to his hide. But there ain't no call for real weaving no more. Everything's cheapin' down machine stuff these days. Where is your home? Penny questioned curiously. Me and my old woman was born and raised in the Red Valley. Ever been there? No, I can't say as I have. It's one of the prettiest spots God ever made, the old man said proudly. You never seen such green pastures and the hills kind of take your breath away only at night there's strange creatures tracking through the woods and some says there's haunts penny glanced quickly at her companion haunts she inquired before the old man could answer they had reached the want ad counter an employee of the paper immediately appeared to accept the advertisement his rapid-fire questions, as he counted words and assessed charges, bewildered the poor old hillman. Penny supplied the answers as best she could. However, in her haste to be finished with the task, she forgot to have the old fellow leave his name and address. "'You were saying something about haunts,' she reminded him eagerly as they walked away from the desk. "'You don't really believe in ghosts, do you, Mr.' "'Silas Malcolm,' the old man supplied." That's my name, and they ain't the better one in Hopestine County. So, be you interested in haunts? Well, yes, I am, Penny admitted, her eyes dancing. I like all types of mystery. Just lead me to it. Well, here's something that will make your pretty eyes pop. Chuckling, the old man fumbled in his pocket and produced a worn newspaper clipping. Penny saw that it had been clipped, from the Hobostein County Weekly. It read, $500 reward offered for any information leading to the capture of the headless horseman. For particulars, see J. Burmaster, Sleepy Hollow. This is a strange advertisement, Penny commented aloud. The only headless horseman to my knowledge was the famous galloping Hessian in the story, Legend of Sleepy Hollow. But in reality, such things can't exist. Maybe not, said the old man. But we got one in the valley just the same. And if what folks says is so, that headless horseman's likely to make a heap of trouble for someone, for he's through with his haunting. Penny stared soberly into the twinkling blue eyes of her aged companion, as a character, he completely baffled her. Did he mean what he said, or was he merely trying to lead her on with hints of mystery? At any rate, the bait was too tempting to resist. Tell me more, she urged. Exactly what do you know about this advertisement? 
Nothing. Nary a thing, miss. But there's haunts at Sleepy Hollow, and don't you think there ain't? I seen em myself from Witchin Rock. And where is Witching Rock? Even the words intrigued Penny. Just a place on Humpy Hill, looking down over the valley. Finding her companion none too willing to impart additional information, Penny reread the advertisement. The item had appeared in the Hobostein County paper only the previous week. The words themselves, rather than the offer of a reward, enchanted her. Headless horseman, witching rock, she thought excitedly. Why, even the name scream of mystery. Aloud, she urged, Mr. Malcolm, do tell me more about this matter. Who is Mr. Burmaster? There was no answer. Penny glanced up from the advertisement and stared in astonishment. The elderly man no longer stood beside her. Not a soul was in the long, empty hall. The old man of the hills had vanished as quietly as if spirited away by an unseen hand. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Scowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 2. Plans. Now what became of that old man? Penny asked herself in perplexity. I didn't hear him steal away. He couldn't have vanished into thin air. Or did he? Thinking that Mr. Malcolm might have gone back to the want-ad department, she hastily returned there. To her anxious inquiry, the clerk responded with a grin. No, old Whiskers hasn't been here. If you find him, ask for his address. He forgot to leave it. Decidedly disturbed, Penny ran down the hall, which gave exit to the street. Breathlessly, she asked the elevator attendant if he had seen an old man leave the building. A fellow with a long white beard? Yes, and a cane. Which way did he go? Can't tell you that. But you did see him, Penny demanded impatiently. Sure, he went out the door a minute or two ago. He was talking to himself like he was a bit cracked in the head. He was chuckling as if he knew a great joke. And I'm it, Penny muttered. She darted through the revolving doors to the street. With the noon hour close at hand, throngs of persons poured from the various offices. Amid the bustling, hurrying crowd, she saw no one who remotely resembled the old man of the hills. He slipped away on purpose, she thought, half resentfully. He gave me that newspaper clipping just to stir my interest, and then left without explaining a thing. Abandoning the search as hopeless, Penny again reread the clipping. Five hundred dollars offered for information leading to the capture of a headless horseman. Why, it sounded fantastic, but the advertisement actually had appeared in a country newspaper. Therefore, it must have some basis, in fact. Still mulling the matter over in her mind, Penny climbed a long flight of stairs to the Star Newsroom. Near the door stood an empty desk. For many years, that desk had been occupied by Jerry Livingston, crack reporter, now absent on military leave. It gave Penny a tight feeling to see the covered typewriter, for she and Jerry had shared many grand times together. She went quickly on, past a long row of desks where other reporters tapped out their stories. She nodded to Mr. DeWitt, the city editor, waved at Salt Summers, photographer, and entered her father's private office. Hello, Dad, she greeted him cheerfully. Busy? I was. Anthony Parker put aside the mouthpiece of a dictaphone machine to smile fondly at his one and only child. He was a tall, lean man, and a recent illness had left him even thinner than before. Penny sank into an upholstered chair in front of her father's desk. If it's money you want, began Mr. Parker, the answer is no. Not one cent until your allowance is due. And no sob story, please. Why, Dad, Penny shot him an injured look. I wasn't even thinking of money. At least not such a trivial amount as exchanges hands on my allowance day. Nothing less than $500 interests me. 
Five hundred dollars?" "Oh, I aim to earn it myself," Penny assured him hastily. "How, may I ask?" "Maybe by catching a Headless Horseman." Penny grinned mischievously. "It seems that one is galloping wild out Red Valley way." "Red Valley? Never heard of the place." Mr. Parker began to show irritation. "Penny, what are you talking about anyway?" "This," explained Penny, spreading the clipping on the desk. "An old fellow who looks like Rip Van Winkle gave it to me. Then he disappeared before I could ask him any questions. What do you think, Dad?" Mr. Parker read the advertisement at a glance. "Bunk!" he exploded. "Pure bunk!" "But, Dad," protested Penny hotly, "it was printed in the Hobostein Weekly." "I don't care who published it or where. I still say bunk." "Wasn't that the same word you used not so long ago when I tried to tell you about a certain witch doll?" teased Penny. "I started off on what looked like a foolish chase, but I came back dragging one of the best news stories the _Star_ ever published. Remember?" "No chance you'll ever let me forget." "Dad, I have a hunch," Penny went on, ignoring the jibe. "There's a big story in this Headless Horseman business. I feel it." "I suppose you'd like to have me assign you the task of tracking down your front page gem." "Now you're talking my language." "Penny, can't you see this is only a joke?" Mr. Parker asked in exasperation. "The Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow? That story was written years ago by a man named Washington Irving, or didn't you know?" "Oh, I've read The Legend of Sleepy Hollow," Penny retorted loftily. "I remember one of the characters was Ichabod Crane. He was chased by the Headless Horseman and nearly died of fright." "A nice bit of fiction," commented Mr. Parker. He tapped the newspaper clipping. And so is this. The best place for it is in the scrap basket. Oh, no, it isn't! Penny leaped forward to rescue the precious clipping. Carefully, she folded it into her purse. Dad, I'm convinced Sleepy Hollow must be a real place. Why can't I go there to interview Mr. Burmaster? Did you say Burmaster? Yes, the person who offers the reward. He signed himself J. Burmaster. That name is rather familiar, Mr. Parker said thoughtfully. Wonder if it could be John Burmaster the millionaire? Probably not, but I recall that a man by that name built an estate called Sleepy Hollow somewhere in the hill country. There, Penny cried triumphantly. You see, the story does have substance after all. May I make the trip? How would you find Burmaster? A big estate shouldn't be hard to locate. I can trace him through the Hobostein Weekly. What do you say, Dad? The matter is for Mrs. Weems to decide. Now scram out of here. I have work to do. Thanks for letting me go, laughed Penny, giving him a big hug. Now, about finances. But we'll discuss that angle later. Blowing her father an airy kiss, she pranced out of the office. Penny fairly trod on clouds as she raced toward the home of her chum, Louise Sidell. Her dark-haired chum sat listlessly on the porch reading a book, but she jumped to her feet when she saw her friend. From the way Penny took the steps at one leap, she knew there was important news to divulge. "'What's up?' she demanded alertly. "'Hop, skip, and count three, laughed Penny. "'We're about to launch forth into a grand and glorious adventure. "'How would you like to go in search of a headless horseman?' Any kind of a creature suits me, chuckled Louise. When do we start and where? Lead me to a map and I'll try to answer your questions. Our first problem is to find a place called Red Valley. For half an hour, the two girls pored over a state map. Hobostein County was an area close by, while Red Valley proved to be an isolated little locality less than a day's journey from Riverview. Penny was further encouraged to learn that the valley she proposed to visit had been settled by Dutch pioneers and that many of the original families still had descendants living there. It will be an interesting trip even if we don't run into any mystery, Louise said philosophically. Are you sure you can go, Penny? Well, pretty sure. Dad said it was up to Mrs. Weems to decide. Louise gave her chum a sideways glance. That sounds like a mighty big if. 
to me." "Oh, I'll bring her around somehow. Pack your suitcase, Lou. We'll start tomorrow morning bright and early." Though Penny spoke with confidence, she was less certain of her powers as she entered her own home a few minutes later. She found Mrs. Weems, the stout, middle-aged housekeeper, in the kitchen making cookies. "'Now, please don't gobble any of that raw dough,' Mrs. Weems remonstrated as the girl reached for one of the freshly cut circles. "'Can't you wait until they're baked?' Penny perched herself on the sink counter. Reminded that her heels were making marks on the cabinet door, she drew them up beneath her and balanced like an acrobat. Forthwith, she launched into a glowing tale of her morning's activities. The story failed to bring a responsive warmth from the housekeeper. "'I declare I can't make sense out of what you're saying,' she protested. "'Headless horseman? My word! I'm afraid you're the one who's lost your head. The ideas you do get!' Mrs. Weems sadly heaved a deep sigh. Since the death of Mrs. Parker many years before, she had assumed complete charge of the household. However, the task of raising Penny had been almost too much for the patient woman. Though she loved the girl as her own, there were times when she felt that running a three-ring circus would be much easier. "'Louise and I plan to start for Red Valley by train early tomorrow,' said Penny briskly. "'We'll probably catch the 925 if I can get up in time.' "'And has your father said you may go?' He said it was up to you. Mrs. Weems smiled grimly. Then the matter is settled. I shall put my foot down. Oh, Mrs. Weems, Penny wailed. Please don't ruin all of our plans. The trip means so much to me. I've heard that argument before, replied Mrs. Weems, unmoved. I see no reason why I should allow you to start off on such a wild chase. But I expect to get a dandy story for Dad's paper. That's only an excuse, sighed the housekeeper. The truth is that you crave adventure and excitement. It's a trait which, unfortunately, you inherited from your father. Penny decided to play her trump card. Mrs. Weems, Red Valley is one of those picturesque hidden localities where families have gone on for generation after generation the place must fairly swim with antiques. Wouldn't you like to have me buy you a few while I'm there? Despite her intentions, Mrs. Weems displayed interest. As Penny very well knew, collecting antiques had become an absorbing hobby with her. Silas Malcolm has a spinning wheel for sale, Penny went on, pressing home the advantage she had gained. I'll find him if I can and buy it for you. Your schemes are as transparent as glass. But you will let me go? I probably will, sighed Mrs. Weems. I've learned to my sorrow that in any event, you usually get your way. Penny danced out of the kitchen to a telephone. It's all set, she gleefully told Louise. We leave early tomorrow morning for Red Valley. And if I don't earn that $500 reward, then my name isn't Penny Gumshoe Parker. End of chapter two. Chapter three of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter three. Into the Valley. The slow train crept around a bend and puffed to a standstill at the drowsing little station of Hobostein. Louise and Penny, their linen suits must from many weary hours of sitting, were the only passengers to alight. "'Yesterday it seemed like a good idea,' sighed Louise, "'but now I'm not so sure.' Penny stepped aside to avoid a dolly truck which was being pushed down the deserted platform by a station attendant. She, too, felt ill at ease in this strange town, and the task she had set for herself suddenly seemed a silly one. But not for anything in the world would she make such an admission. First, we'll find the newspaper office, she said briskly. This town is so small it can't be far away. They carried their overnight bags into the stuffy little station. 
the agent, in shirt sleeves and green shade, speared a train order on the spindle, then glanced curiously at the girls. Anything I can do for you? Yes, replied Penny. Please tell us how to find the offices of the Hobostein Weekly. It's just down the road a piece, directed the agent. Go past the old town pump and the livery stable. Red brick building. Best one in town. Can't miss it. Penny and Louise took their bags and crossed to the shady side of the street. A horse and carriage had been tied to a hitching post, and by contrast, an expensive new automobile was parked beside it. The unpaved road was thick with dust. The broken sidewalk was coated with it, as were the little plots of struggling grass. In the entire town, few persons were abroad. An old lady in a sunbonnet busily loaded boxes of groceries into a farm wagon. The only other sign of activity was at the livery stable, where a group of men slouched on the street benches. Must we pass there? Louise murmured. Those men are staring as if they never saw a girl before. Let them, said Penny, undisturbed. Two doors beyond the livery stable stood a newly built red brick building. In gold paint on the expanse of unwashed plate glass window were the words, Hobostein Weekly. With heads high, the girls ran the gauntlet of loungers and reached the newspaper office. Through the plate glass, they glimpsed a large, cluttered room where desks, bins of type, table forms, and a massive flatbed press all seemed jammed together. A rotund man, they took to be the editor, was talking to a customer in a loud voice. Neither took the slightest notice of the girls as they pushed open the door. "'I don't care what you say or how much money you have,' the editor was saying heatedly. "'I run my paper as I please. See? If you don't like my editorials, you don't have to read them.' "'You're a pin-headed, stubborn Dutchman,' the other man retorted. "'It makes no difference to me what you run in your stupid old weekly, "'providing you don't deliberately try to stir up the people of this valley.' "'Worried about your pocketbook?' "'I'm the largest taxpayer in the valley. "'If there's an assessment for repairs on the Huntley Lake Dam, "'it will cost me thousands of dollars.' And if you had an ounce of sense, you'd see that without the repairs, your property may not be worth a nickel. If these rains keep up, the dams have to give way, and your property would go down in the twinkling of an eye. Not that I am worried about your property, but I am concerned about the folk who are trying to live in the valley. Schultz, you're a calamity howler, the other man accused. There's no danger of the dam giving way, and you know it. By writing these hot editorials, you're just trying to stir up public feeling. You're hoping to shake me down, so I'll underwrite a costly and unnecessary repair bill. The editor pushed back his chair and arose. His voice remained controlled, but his eyes snapped like firebrands. Get out of this office, he ordered. The Hobostein Weekly can do without your subscription. You have been a pain to this community ever since you came. Good afternoon. You can't talk like that to me, Byron Schultz, the other man began hotly. Then his gaze fell upon Louise and Penny, who stood just inside the door. Jamming on his hat, he went angrily from the building. The editor crumpled the sheet of paper and hurled it into a waste paper basket. The act seemed to restore his good humor, for, with a wry grin, he turned toward the girls. Yes? he inquired. Penny scarcely knew how to begin. Sliding into a chair beside the editor's desk, she fumbled in her purse for the advertisement clipped from the Hobostein Weekly. To her confusion, she could not find it. Lose something? the editor inquired kindly that's my trouble too last week we misplaced the copy for greg's grocery store and was jake hoppin mad found it again just before the weekly went to press here it is penny said triumphantly she placed the clipping on mr schultz's desk haven't i had enough of that man in one day the editor snorted that old skinflint never paid me for the ad either who is jay burmaster 
Penny inquired eagerly. Who is he? The editor's gray-blue eyes sent out little flashes of fire. He's the most egotistical, thick-headed, muddle-brained property owner in this community. Not the man who was just here. Yes, that was John Burmaster. Then he lives in Hobostein. He does not, said the editor with emphasis. It's bad enough having him seven miles away. You don't mean to tell me you haven't seen Sleepy Hollow Estate? Penny shook her head. She explained that, as strangers to the town, she and Louise had made no trips or inquiries. Sleepy Hollow is quite a showplace, the editor went on grudgingly. Old Burmaster built it about a year ago. The house has a long bridge leading up to it, and is supposed to be like the Sleepy Hollow of legend. Only the legend kind of backfired. You're speaking about the headless horseman. Penny leaned forward in her chair. When Burmaster built his house, the old skinflint didn't calculate on getting a haunt to go with it, the editor chuckled. Serves him right for being so mulish. But what is the story of the headless horseman? Penny asked. Has Mr. Burmaster actually offered a $500 reward for its capture? He'd give double that amount to get that horseman off his neck, chuckled the editor. But folks up Delta Way aren't so dumb. The reward will never be collected. Is Delta the name of a town? Yes, it's up the valley a piece, explained Mr. Schultz. You don't seem very familiar with our layout here. No, my friend and I come from Riverview. Well, you see, it's like this. The editor drew a crude map for the girls. Sleepy Hollow Estate is situated in a sort of V-shaped valley. Just below it is the little town of Delta, and on below that, a hamlet called Raven. We're at the foot of the valley, so to speak. Huntley Lake and the dam are just above Sleepy Hollow Estate. And is there really danger that the dam will give way? If you want my opinion, read the Hobostein Weekly, answered the editor. The dam won't wash out tomorrow or the next day, but if these rains keep on, the whole valley's in danger. But try to pound any sense into Burmaster's thick head. You started to tell me about the headless horseman, Penny reminded him. Did I now? smiled the editor. Don't recollect it myself. Fact is, Burmaster's ghost troubles don't interest me one whit. But we've come all the way from Riverview just to find out about the headless horseman. Calculate on earning that reward? The editor's eyes twinkled. Perhaps. Then you won't want to waste time trying to get second-hand information. Burmaster's the man for you to see. Talk to him. Well, no, you talk to Burmaster, the editor said with finality. Only don't tell him I sent you. But how will we find the man? Penny was rather dismayed to have the interview end before it was well launched. Oh, his car is parked down the street, the editor answered carelessly. Everyone in town knows Burmaster. I'd talk to you longer, only I'm so busy this afternoon. Burmaster is the one to tell you his own troubles. Thus dismissed, the girls could do nothing but thank the editor and leave the newspaper building. Dubiously, they looked up and down the street. The fine new car they had noticed a little while earlier no longer was parked at the curb, nor was there any sign of the man who had just left the newspaper office. All we can do is inquire for him, said Penny. At a grocery store farther down the street, they paused to ask if Mr. Burmaster had been seen. The storekeeper finished grinding a pound of coffee for a customer and then answered Penny's question. Mr. Burmaster? he repeated. Why, yes, he was in town, but he pulled out about five minutes ago. Then we've just missed him, Penny exclaimed. Burmaster's on his way to Sleepy Hollow by this time, the storekeeper agreed. You might catch him there. But how can we get to Sleepy Hollow? Well, there's a train. Only runs once a day, though, and it went through about half an hour ago. That was the train we came in on. Isn't there a car one can hire? Don't know of any car, 
Clem Williams has some good horses, though. He keeps the livery stable down the street. Their faces very long, the girls picked up their overnight bags and went outside again. I knew this trip would be a washout, said Louise disconsolately. Here we are, stuck high and dry until our train comes in tomorrow. But why give up so easily? We're licked, that's why. We've missed Mr. Burmaster, and we can't go to Sleepy Hollow after him. Penny gazed thoughtfully down the street at Clem Williams' livery stable. Why can't we go to Sleepy Hollow? she demanded. Let's rent horses. Louise waxed sarcastic. To be sure, we can canter along, balancing these overnight bags on the pommel of our saddles. We'll have to leave our luggage behind, Penny planned briskly. The most essential things we can just wrap up in knapsacks. But I'm not a good rider, Louise complained. The last time we rode a mile, I couldn't walk for a week. Seven miles isn't so far. Seven miles? Louise gasped. Why, it's slaughter. Oh, you'll last, chuckled Penny confidently. I'll see to that. I am curious to see that Sleepy Hollow estate, Louise admitted with reluctance. All that talk about the Huntley Dam interested me, too. And the Headless Horseman? That part rather worries me. Penny, do you realize that if we go to Sleepy Hollow, we may run into more than we bargained for? Penny laughed and, grasping her chum's arm, pulled her down the street. That's just what I hope for, she confessed. Unless Sleepy Hollow lets us down shamefully, our adventure is just starting. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Hoof Beats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 4 A Stranger of the Road. Even for late September, it was a warm day. The horses plodded slowly up a steep winding trail, heavily canopied with yellowing maple leaves. Louise and Penny swished angrily at the buzzing mosquitoes and tried to urge their tired mounts to a faster pace. I warned you this trip would be slaughter, Louise complained, ducking to avoid a tree limb. Furthermore, I suspect we're lost. How could we be when we haven't turned off the trail? Penny called over her shoulder. She rode ahead on a sorry-looking nag appropriately named Bones. The animal was more easily managed than the skittish mare Louise had chosen at Williams' livery stable, but had an annoying appetite for foliage. Mr. Williams' directions were clear enough, Penny resumed. He said to follow this trail until we reach a little town named Delta. Providing we survive that long, Louise interposed crossly. How far from Delta to Sleepy Hollow? Not more than two or three miles, and once we get down out of these hills into the valley, the going should be much easier. Penny spoke with forced cheerfulness. In truth, she too had wearied of the trip, which in the last hour had become sheer torture instead of adventure. Her freckled face was blotched with mosquito bites. Every hairpin had been jolted from her head, and muscles fairly screamed a protest. Louise, on an unruly horse, had taken even more punishment. Penny gave Bones a dig in the ribs. The horse quickened his step, weaving a corkscrew path around the trunks of the giant trees. Gradually, the tangle of brush and trees began to thin. They came at last to the brow of the hill. Penny drew rein beside a huge moss-covered rock. Below stretched a beautiful rich green valley through which wound a flood-swollen river. From the chimney tops of a cluster of houses, smoke curled lazily, blending into the blue rim of the distant hills. Did you ever see a prettier little valley? Penny asked, her interest reviving. That must be Delta down there. Louise was too weary to look or answer. She slid out of the saddle and tossed the reins over a tree limb. Nearby, a spring gushed from between rocks. 
She walked stiffly to it and drank deeply of the cool water. Lou, the valley looks exactly as I hoped it would, Penny went on eagerly. It has a dreamy, drowsy atmosphere, just as Irving described the sleepy hollow of legend. Louise bent to drink of the spring again. She sponged her hot face with a dampened handkerchief. Pulling off shoes and stockings, she let the cool water trickle over her bare feet. According to legend, the valley and its inhabitants were bewitched, Penny rambled on. Why, the Indians considered these hills as the abode of spirits. Sometimes the spirits took mischievous delight in wreaking trouble upon the villagers. Penny's voice trailed off. From far down the hillside came the faint thud of hoofbeats. The girl's attention became fixed upon a moving horseman on the road below. Now what? inquired Louise impatiently. Don't try to tell me you've seen the headless horseman already. I've certainly seen a horseman. Mike, can that fellow ride? Louise picked up her shoes and hobbled over the stones to the trail's end. Through a gap in the trees, she gazed down upon a winding turnpike fringed on either side with an old-fashioned rail fence. A horseman, mounted on a roan mare, rode bareback at full run. As the girls watched in admiration, the mare took the low fence in one magnificent leap and crashed out of sight through the trees. "'You're right, Penny,' Louise acknowledged. "'What I wouldn't give to be able to ride like that.' one of the villagers, I suppose. The hoofbeats rapidly died away. Louise turned wearily around, intending to remount her horse. She stared in astonishment. Where the mare had grazed, there was now only trampled grass. Where's my horse? she demanded. Where's Whitefoot? Spirited away by the witches, maybe. This is no time for any of your feeble jokes, Penny Parker. That stupid horse must have wandered off while I was admiring your old valley and that rider. Penny remained undisturbed. Oh, we'll find the mare all right, she said confidently. She can't be far away. The girls thought that they heard a crashing of underbrush to the left of the trail. Investigation did not disclose that the horse had gone that way. They could hear no hoofbeats, nor was any of the grass trampled. I'll bet Whitefoot's on her way back to William's stable by this time, Louise declared crossly. Such luck! She sat down on a stone and put on her shoes and stockings. We didn't hear the horse run off, Lou. She can't be far. Then you find her. I've had all I can stand. I'm tired, and I'm hungry, and I wish I'd never come on this wild, silly chase. Tears began to trickle down Louise's heat-mottled face. Penny slid down from Bones and patted her chum's arm awkwardly. Louise pulled away from her. Now don't give me any pep talk, or I'll simply bawl, she warned. What am I going to do without a horse? Why, that's easy, Lou. We'll ride double. Back to William's stable? Well, not tonight. It's getting late. And after coming this far, it would be foolish to turn around and start right back. It would be the most sensible act of our lives, Louise retorted. But then I might know you'd insist on pushing on. You and Christopher Columbus have a lot in common. We came to find out about that headless horseman, didn't we? You did, I guess. Louise sighed, getting up from the rock. I just came along because I'm weak-minded. Well, what's the plan? Let's ride down to Delta and try to get a room for the night. Louise's silence gave consent. She climbed up behind Penny on bones, and they jogged down the trail toward the turnpike. It's queer how Whitefoot sneaked away without making a sound, Penny presently commented. According to the old legend, strange things did happen in the Sleepy Hollow Valley. The spirit was supposed to wreak all sorts of vexations upon the inhabitants. Sometimes he would take the shape of a bear or a deer and lead bewildered hunters a merry chase through the woods. You're the one who's bewitched, Louise broke in. 
And if you ask me, you've been that way ever since you were born. There's a little spark, something deep within you that keeps saying, Go on, Penny. Sick em, Penny. Maybe you'll find a mystery. Well, perhaps I shall, too. Oh, I don't doubt that. You've turned up some dandy news stories for your dad's paper, but this is different. How so? In the first place, we both know there's no such thing as a headless horseman. It must all be a joke. Would you call that advertisement in the Hobostein paper a joke? It could have been. We don't know many of the facts. That's why we're here. Penny guided Bones on to the wide turnpike. Before she could add more, Louise's grasp about her waist suddenly tightened. Listen, Penny, someone's coming. Penny drew rein. Distinctly, both girls could hear the clop-clop of approaching hoofbeats. Their hope that it might be Whitefoot was quickly dashed. A moment later, the same horseman that they had observed a few minutes earlier swung around the bend. The young man rapidly overtook the girls. From the way he grinned, they suspected that they presented a ridiculous sight as they rocked along on bone swaying back. He sat his own horse, a handsome roan, with easy grace. Louise tugged at her skirt, which kept creeping above her knees. He's laughing at us, she muttered under her breath. The rider cantered up, then deliberately slowed his horse to a walk. Louise stole a quick sideways glance. The young man was dark-haired, about twenty-six, and very good-looking. His flashing brown eyes were friendly, and so was his voice as he spoke a cheery, "'Lo, girls!' "'Hello!' Penny responded briefly. Louise immediately nudged her in the ribs, a silent warning that she considered the stranger fresh. Nevertheless, Penny twisted sideways in the saddle, the better to look at their road companion. He wore whipcord riding breeches and highly polished boots. From the well-tailored cut of his clothes, she decided that he, too, was a comparative stranger to the hill country. "'Not looking for a horse by any chance, are you?' Louise's snubbed nose came down out of the sky. "'Oh, are we?' she cried. "'Where did you see her?' "'A mare with a white foot, her left hind one.' "'Yes, that's white foot!' Louise exclaimed joyfully. "'The stupid creature wandered off.' saw her making for the valley about five minutes ago like enough she turned in at silas malcolm's place the name took penny by surprise although she had hoped to find the old man who had visited the star office she had not thought it possible without a long search does mr malcolm live near here she inquired yes his farm's on down the pike we'll meet a ride along and show you the way under the circumstances, Penny and Louise had no choice but to accept the offer. However, they both thought that the young man merely was making an excuse to accompany them. He seemed to read their minds, for he said, I didn't actually see your missing horse turn in at the Malcolm place. Know why I think she'll be there? Perhaps you have supernatural powers, Penny said lightly. From what we hear, this valley is quite a place for witches and headless horsemen. The young man gave her an amused glance. The explanation is quite simple, he laughed. Silas used to own that horse. All horses have a strong homing instinct, you know. I've noticed that, Louise contributed a bit grimly. I guess I should introduce myself, the young man resumed. Name's Joe Quigley. I'm the station agent at Delta. We're glad to meet you. Penny responded. Though Louise scowled at her, she gave their own names. She added that they had come to the valley seeking information about the mysterious headless horseman. Friends of Mr. Burmaster? Quigley inquired casually. Oh, no, Penny assured him. We just came for the fun of it. Is it true that some prankster has been causing trouble in the valley? A prankster? Yes, someone fixed up to resemble the headless horseman of fable. Quigley grinned broadly. Well, now, you couldn't prove it by me. Some folks say that on certain foggy nights the old gallopin' Hessian does ride down out of the hills. But then there are folks who claim that butter won't churn because it's been bewitched. 
I've never put much stock in such talk myself. Then you've never actually seen such a writer. Joe Quigley remained silent. After a thoughtful interval, he admitted, Well, one night over a month ago, I did see something strange. What was it? Louise asked quickly. Quigley pointed far up the hillside. See that big boulder? Witch in Rock, it's called. Penny nodded. We were up there only a few minutes ago. That night, fog rises up from the valley and gives the place a spooky look. Years ago, a tramp was killed there. No one ever did learn the how or the why of it. What was it you saw? Penny inquired. I can't rightly say, Quigley returned soberly. I was on this same turnpike when I chanced to glance up toward that big rock. I saw something there in the mist, and then, the next minute, it was gone. Not the headless horseman, Penny asked. Maybe it was, and maybe it wasn't. I'd have thought I'd imagined it, only I heard clattering hoofbeats. But I can tell you one thing about this valley. What's that? asked Louise. All the inhabitants are said to be bewitched. That's why I act so crazy myself. Penny tossed her head. Oh, you're just laughing at us, she accused. I suppose it does sound silly to say we came here searching for a headless horseman. No, it's not the least silly, Quigley corrected. I might pay you a compliment by saying you impress me as very courageous young ladies. May I offer a word of advice? Thank you, I don't think we care for it. Nevertheless, I aim to give it anyway. Quigley grinned down at Penny. You see, I know who you are. You're Anthony Parker's daughter, and you built up a reputation for solving mysteries. Penny was astonished, for she had not mentioned her father's name. Never mind how I knew, said Quigley, for stalling questions. Here's my tip. No one ever will collect Burmaster's reward offer. So don't waste time and energy trailing a phantom. Why do you say the reward will never be collected? Quigley would not answer. With a provoking shake of his head, he pointed down the pike to an unpainted cabin and a huge new barn. That's the Malcolm place, he said. If I'm not mistaken, your missing horse is grazing by the gate. Goodbye and good luck. With a friendly, half-mocking salute, he wheeled his mount. The next instant, horse and rider had crashed through a gap in the roadside brush and were lost to view. End of chapter 4《ホフビーツ・オン・ザ・トゥーン・パイク》by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 5 Sleepy Hollow Estate. I'm afraid that young man was having fun at our expense, Penny remarked after horse and rider had gone. How do you suppose he knew about my father? Read it in the newspaper, probably. You've both been in the headlines often enough. Louise sighed wearily and shifted positions. I certainly wish we'd never come here. Well, I don't, Penny said with emphasis. She clucked to Bones, and when he failed to move smartly along, gave him a quick jab with her heels. If Joe Quigley won't tell us about that galloping ghost, maybe Mr. Malcolm will. I'll settle for my missing horse, Louise responded. The girls jogged on down the road toward the Malcolm cabin. Already the hills were casting long blue shadows over the valley floor. With night fast approaching, Penny began to wonder where they could seek lodging. You don't catch me staying at the Malcolm place, Louise said, reading her chum's thought. It's too ramshackle. Drawing near the cabin, both girls were elated to see Whitefoot grazing contentedly in a stony field adjoining the Malcolm barnyard. At the gate, Penny alighted nimbly and threw it open so that Louise could ride through. The creaking of the rusty hinges brought Silas Malcolm down from the tumble-down house. He stared blankly for a moment and then recognized Penny. 
Well, bless my heart, he said. If it ain't the young lady that helped me at the newspaper office. And now it's your turn to help us, laughed Penny. We've lost our horse. I knowed somebody would be along for her pretty soon, the old man chuckled. She run into the barnyard about ten minutes ago, and I turned her out to graze. I'll get her for you. If Mr. Malcolm was surprised to see Penny so far from Riverview, he did not disclose it. He asked no questions. Hobbling to the fence, he whistled a shrill blast. Whitefoot pricked up her ears and then came trotting over to nuzzle the old man's hand. "'You certainly have that horse under control,' said Penny admiringly. "'I guess it's all in the way you handle him. "'It's also all in the way you handle a flying fortress or a stick of dynamite,' Louise cut in. "'You may have my share of horses.' "'Whitefoot didn't throw you off?' Mr. Malcolm inquired. "'Oh, no.' Louise assured him, and explained how the horse had run away. Old Silas chuckled appreciatively. Whitefoot always did have a habit of sneaking off like that. Raised her from a colt, but had to sell her to Williams down in Hobostein when I got short of cash. Wrapping the reins about a hitching post, the old man allowed his gaze to wander toward the valley. With a gesture that was hard to interpret, he indicated the long stretch of fertile pasture land, golden grain fields, and orderly rows of young orchard trees. See that? he commanded. It's a beautiful valley, Louise murmured politely. It's more than that, corrected the old man. You're a looking at one of the richest parcels of land in this here state. Me and the old woman lived down there for going on twenty year. Then we was put out of our cabin. Now that penny pinchin burmaster owns every acre for as far as you can see, not counting the village of Delta and three acres held for spite by the widder Lear. Old Silas took a chew of tobacco and pointed to a trim little log cabin visible through a gap in the trees. Stands out like a sore thumb, don't it? Burmaster's done everything he can to get rid of that place, but the widder Lear just sits tight and won't have no dealings with him. She says if that old skinflint comes around her place again, she's going to run him off with a shotgun. Penny and Louise waited, hoping that the old man would tell more. After a little silence, he resumed meditatively. Oh, the widder was the smartest of the lot of us. From the first, she said Burmaster was out to gobble up all the best land for hisself. Nobody could get her to sign no papers. That's why she's got her little place today, and the rest of us is trying to make a living out of these stone patches. Burmaster forced all of the valley folk off their land? Penny inquired, perplexed. How could he do that? Oh, some of them sold out to him, old Silas admitted. But mostly the land was owned by a rich feller in Boston. He never paid no attention to his holdings, except to collect bit of rent now and then. Last spring he up and sold out to Burmaster, and we was all told to get off the land. Penny nodded thoughtfully. I suppose that was entirely legal. If Mr. Burmaster bought and paid for the land, one really couldn't accuse him of dishonest dealings. I ain't accusing nobody of nothing, old Silas replied. I'm just telling you how things are in this here valley. You came to find out about that headless horseman, didn't you? Well, yes, we did, Penny acknowledged. Oh, I figured you would. You'll never win that reward Burmaster's offering. But you could do a heap of good in this here valley. How? Penny asked, even more puzzled. You got a pa that runs a big city newspaper. When he prints an editorial piece in that paper of his, folks read it and pay attention. I'm afraid I don't understand. Oh, you will, after you've been here a while, the old man chuckled. Where are you gals calculating to spend the night? I wish we knew. Me and the old woman be glad to take you in, only we ain't got no room fitting for city raised gals. The widder Lear be glad to give you bed and fodder. The girls thanked Mr. Malcolm, though secretly they were sure they would keep on until they reached Delta. A suspicion was growing in Penny's mind that she had not come to the valley of her own free will, 
Rather, she had been lured there by old Silas's headless horseman tale. She had assumed the old fellow to be a simple trusting hillman, while in truth he meant to make use of her. "'Calculate you're anxious like to get down to the valley before night sets in,' the old man resumed. "'Turnpike's no fitting place for a gal after dark.' "'You think we might meet the headless horseman?' Penny asked, smiling. Old Silas deliberately allowed the question to pass. "'Just follow the turnpike,' he instructed. "'You'll come first to the Burmaster place. Then on beyond is the Widder Lear's cabin. She'll treat you right.' Penny had intended to ask old Silas if he still had a spinning wheel for sale. However, a glimpse of the darkening sky warned her that there was no time to waste. She and Louise must hasten on, unless they expected to be overtaken by night. "'Goodbye,' Penny said, vaulting into the saddle. "'We'll probably see you again before we leave the valley.' "'Calculate you will,' agreed old Silas. As he opened the gate for the girls, he smiled in a way they could not fathom. Once more on the curving turnpike, Penny and Louise discussed the old man's strange words. Both were agreed that Silas had not been in the least surprised to see them. "'But why did he say I could do good in the valley?' Penny speculated. "'Evidently he thinks I'll influence my father to write something in the star.' "'Against Burmaster, perhaps.' nodded louise everyone we've met seems to dislike that man the girls clattered over a little log bridge and rounded a bend giant trees arched their limbs over the pike creating a dark cool tunnel penny and louise urged their tired horses to a faster pace though neither would have admitted it they had no desire to be on the turnpike after nightfall listen louise commanded suddenly what was that sound Penny drew rein to listen. Only a chirp of a cricket disturbed the eerie stillness. "'Just for a minute I thought I heard hoofbeats,' Louise said apologetically. "'Guess I must have imagined it.' Emerging from the long avenue of trees, the girls were slightly dismayed to see how swiftly darkness had spread its cloak on the valley. Beyond the next turn of the corkscrew road stood a giant tulip tree. Riding beneath it, Penny stared up at the gnarled limbs, which were twisted in fantastic shapes. "'There was an old tulip tree in the legend of Sleepy Hollow,' she murmured in awe. "'And it was close by that the headless horseman appeared.' "'Will you please shush?' Louise interrupted. "'I'm jittery enough without any build-up from you.' Some distance ahead stretched a long, narrow bridge with a high wooden railing. By straining their eyes, the girls could see that it crossed a mill pond and led, in a graceful curve, to a rambling manor house of clapboard and stone. "'Mr. Burmaster's estate!' Louise exclaimed. "'And it looks exactly as I imagined it would,' Penny added in delight. "'A perfect setting for the galloping Hessian!' "'Too spooky, if you ask me,' said Louise with a shiver." Why would anyone build an expensive home in such a lonely place? The girls rode on. A group of oaks, heavily matted with wild grapevines, threw a deeper gloom over the road. For a short distance, the dense growth of trees hid the estate from view. Suddenly, the girls were startled to hear the sharp, ringing clop-clop of steel-shod hoofs unmistakably the sound came from the direction of the long narrow bridge there i knew i heard hoofbeats a moment ago louise whispered nervously maybe it is the headless horseman be your age chided penny we both know there's no such thing the words died on her lips from somewhere in the darkness ahead came a woman's terrified scream frightened by the sound bones gave a startled snort with a jerk which nearly flung Penny from the saddle, he plunged on toward the bridge. End of chapter 5
His ears laid back, Bones plunged headlong toward the gloom-shrouded bridge. Pins shook from Penny's head and her hair became a stream of gold in the wind. She hunched low in the saddle but could not stop the horse, though she pulled hard on the reins. As she reached a dense growth of elder bushes, a man leaped out to grasp the bridle. Bones snorted angrily and pounded the earth with his hooves. Oh, thank you, Penny gasped, and then she realized that the man had not meant to help her. So you're the one who's been causing so much trouble here, he exclaimed wrathfully. Get down out of that saddle. I'll do no such thing, Penny retorted. She tried to push him away. Louise came trotting up on Whitefoot. Her unexpected arrival seemed to disconcert the man, for he released Bone's bridle. What's he trying to do? Louise demanded sharply, pulling up beside her chum. Before Penny could find tongue, another man, heavily built, came running across the narrow bridge. His bald head bore no covering, and the long tails of his well-cut coat flapped wildly in the wind. You let that rider get away, Jennings, he cried accusingly to the workman. Did you see him ride across the bridge and then take a trail along the creek bed? No, I didn't, Mr. Burmaster, the workman mumbled. I heard hoofbeats and came as fast as I could here from the grist mill. Only rider I saw was this girl. There's two of them. We have a perfect right to be here, Penny declared. We were riding along the pike when we heard hoofbeats and then a scream. My horse became frightened and plunged down this way toward the bridge. I'm sorry I grabbed the bridle, miss, the workman apologized. You see, I thought... Your trouble, Jennings, is that you never think, cut in the owner of Sleepy Hollow curtly. You never even saw the rider who got away? No, sir, but I'll get the other workmen and go after him. Don't waste your efforts. He was only a boy, not the man we're after. Only a boy, sir? Ah, that scamp clattered a stick against the railings of the bridge just to frighten my wife. Mrs. Burmaster is a very nervous woman. Yes, sir, replied the workman rather emphatically. I know, sir. Oh, you do? Mr. Burmaster asked, his tone unfriendly. Well, get to the house and tell her there's no cause to scream to high heaven. The boy, whoever he was, is gone. I'll tell her, the workman mumbled, starting away. And my next time I order you to watch this road, I mean watch it, the estate owner called after him. If you don't, I'll find another man to take your place. As Mr. Burmaster turned toward the girls, they obtained a better view of his face. He wore glasses, and his cheeks were pouchy, a hooked nose curved down toward a mouth that was hard and firm. Yet when he spoke, it was with a surprisingly pleasant tone of voice. I must apologize for the stupid actions of my workman, he said to Penny. He should have known that you were not the ones that we were after. Not the headless horseman, Penny asked, half-jokingly. Mr. Burmaster stepped closer so that he could gaze up into the girl's face. He scrutinized it for a moment, and then, without answering her question, said, You're a stranger to the valley. Yes, we are. Then may I ask how you knew about our difficulties here at Sleepy Hollow? Penny explained that she had seen the estate owner's advertisement in the Hobostein Weekly. She did not add that it was the real reason why she and Louise had made the long trip from Riverview. I will be willing to pay any amount to be rid of that so-called ghost who annoys us here at Sleepy Hollow, Mr. Burmaster said bitterly. Night after night, my wife has had no rest. The slightest sound terrifies her. Tell us more about the mysterious rider, Penny urged. What time does he appear? Ah, oh, there's no predicting that. Often he rides over the bridge on stormy or foggy nights. Then again, it's apt to be just after dusk. Tonight we thought we had the scamp, but it proved to be only a mischievous boy. Your workmen stand guard? They have orders to watch this bridge day and night. But the men are a lazy lot. They wander off or they go to sleep. Isn't it possible that the disturbance always has been caused by a boy? Perhaps this lad who clattered over the bridge tonight? Impossible, Mr. Burmaster snapped impatiently. I've seen the headless horseman myself at least five times. You mean the rider actually has no head? 
Louise interposed in awe. The appearance is that. Of course, there's no question, but someone from the village or the hills has been impersonating Irving's celebrated character of fiction. Point is, the joke's gone too far. I should think so, Louise murmured sympathetically. My wife and I came to this little valley with only one thought. We wanted to build a fine home for ourselves amid peaceful surroundings. We brought in city workmen, a clever architect. No expense was spared to make this house and estate perfect. But when we tried to recreate the atmosphere of Sleepy Hollow, we didn't anticipate getting a ghost with it. When did the trouble first start? Penny asked. Almost from the hour of our arrival. The country folks didn't like it because we imported city labor. They hindered our efforts. The women were abusive to my wife. Then last Halloween, the headless horseman clattered over this bridge. Couldn't that have been just a holiday prank? Ah, uh, We thought so at first, but a month later, the same thing happened again. This time, the scamp tossed a pebble against our bedroom window. Since then, the rider's been coming at pretty frequent intervals. If you know it's a prank, why should it worry you? Penny inquired. A ah, thing like that wears one down after a while, the owner of the estate said wearily. For myself, I shouldn't mind. But my wife's going to pieces. Was it your wife we heard scream? Louise asked, seeking to keep the conversational ball rolling. Yes, she's apt to go off the deep end whenever anyone rides fast over the bridge. My wife, Mr. Burmaster, did not complete what he had intended to say. At that moment, a soft padding of footsteps was heard, a creaking of boards on the bridge. From the direction of the house came a tall, shadowy figure. "'What were you saying about me, John?' The voice was that of a woman, shrill and strident. Uh, "'My wife,' murmured the estate owner. He turned toward her. "'Matilda,' he said gently. "'These girls are strangers to the valley, and—' "'You were complaining about me to them,' the woman accused. Oh, you needn't deny it. I distinctly heard you. You're always saying things to hurt my feelings. You don't care how I suffer. Isn't it enough that I have to live in this horrible community among such cruel, hateful people without having you turn against me too? Please, Matilda. Don't Matilda me. Apologize at once. Why, certainly I apologize, Mr. Burmaster said soothingly. I was only telling the girls how nervous it makes you when anyone rides at a fast pace over the bridge. And why shouldn't I be nervous? the woman demanded. Since we've come to this community, I've been subjected to every possible insult. I suppose you let that rider get away again. He was only a mischievous boy. I don't care who he was, the woman cried. I want him caught and turned over to the authorities. I want everyone who rides over this bridge arrested. This is a public highway, Matilda. When we built this footbridge over the brook, we had to grant permission for pedestrians and horseback riders to pass. Then make them change the rules. Aren't you the richest man in the valley, or doesn't that mean anything? Mr. Burmaster glanced apologetically at Penny and Louise. The girls, quite taken aback by the woman's tirade, felt rather sorry for him. It was plain to see that Mrs. Burmaster was not a well woman. Her sharp, angular face was drawn as if from constant worry, and she kept patting nervously at the stiff rolls of her hair. "'Well, I guess we'd better be moving on,' Penny said significantly to Louise. "'Yes, we must,' her companion agreed with alacrity. Mr. Burmaster, is Mrs. Lear's place on down this road? The owner of Sleepy Hollow was given no opportunity to answer. Before he could speak, his wife stepped closer, glaring up at Louise in the saddle. So you're friends of Mrs. Lear? she demanded mockingly. I suppose that old hag sent you here to snoop and pry and annoy me. Goodness, no, gasped Louise. We've never even seen the woman, Penny added. Silas Malcolm told us that Mrs. Lear might give us a room for the night. Silas Malcolm, Mrs. Burmaster seized upon the name. He's another one who tries to make trouble for us. If you're in need of a place to stay, uh, you're welcome to stay with us, Mr. Burmaster invited. We have plenty of room. 
Mrs. Burmaster remained silent, but in the semi-darkness the girl saw her give her husband a quick nudge. No need to be told that they were unwelcome by the eccentric mistress of Sleepy Hollow. Thank you, we couldn't possibly stay, Penny said, gathering up the reins. She and Louise walked their horses single file over the creaking bridge. Just as they reached the far end, Mr. Burmaster called to them. Pulling up, they waited for him. Please don't mind my wife, he said in an undertone. She doesn't mean half of what she says. We understand, Penny assured him kindly. You said you were interested in the headless horseman, the estate owner went on hurriedly. Well, my offer holds. I'll pay a liberal reward to anyone who can learn the identity of the prankster. It's no boy, I'm sure of that. Penny replied that she and Louise would like to help if they knew how. We'll talk about that part later on, Mr. Burmaster said. He glanced quickly over his shoulder, observing that his wife was coming. No chance now. You'll stay with Mrs. Lear tonight? If she'll take us in. Oh, she will, though her place is an eyesore. Now, this is what you might do. Get the old lady talking. If she should give you the slightest hint who the prankster is, seize on it. Then you think Mrs. Lear knows? I suspect half the community does. Mr. Burmaster answered bitterly. Everyone except ourselves. We're hated here. No one will cooperate with us. Penny thought over the request. She did not like the idea of going to Mrs. Lear's home to spy. Well, we'll see, she answered without making a definite promise. Mrs. Burmaster was coming across the bridge. Not wishing to talk to her again, the girls bade the owner of Sleepy Hollow a hasty farewell and rode away. Once on the turnpike, they discussed the queer mistress of the estate. If you ask me, everyone in this community is queer, Louise grumbled. Mrs. Burmaster just seems a bit more so than the others. Intent upon reaching the Lear homestead, the saddle-weary girls kept on along the winding highway. It was impossible to make good time, for Whitefoot kept giving Louise trouble. Presently, the mare stopped dead in her tracks, then wheeled and started back toward the Burmaster estate. Louise, bouncing helplessly, shrieked to her chum for help. Rain her in! Penny shouted. When Louise seemed unable to obey, Penny rode Bones alongside and seized the reins. Whitefoot then stopped willingly enough. All I ask of life is to get off this creature, Louise half sobbed. I'm tired enough to die, and we've had nothing to eat since noon. Oh, brace up, Penny encouraged her. It can't be much further to Mrs. Lear's place now. I'll lead your horse for a while. Seizing the reins again, she led Whitefoot down the road at a walk. They met no one on the lonely, twisting highway. The only other sound than the steady clop of hoofbeats was an occasional guttural twang from a bullfrog. The night grew darker. Louise began to shiver, though not so much from cold as nervousness. Her gaze constantly roved the deep woods to the left of the road. Seeing something white and ghostly amid the trees, she called Penny's attention to it. Why, it's nothing, Penny scoffed. Just an old tree trunk split by lightning. That streak of white is the inner wood showing. A bend in the road lay just ahead. Rounding it, the girl saw what appeared to be a campfire glowing in the distance. The wind carried a strong odor of wood smoke. Now what's that? Louise asked uneasily. Someone camping along the road? I can see a house on ahead, Penny replied. The bonfire seems to have been built in the yard. Both girls were convinced that they were approaching the Lear place. The fire, however, puzzled them and their wonderment grew as they rode closer. In the glare of the leaping flames, they saw a huge hanging iron kettle. A dark figure hovered above it, stirring the contents with a stick. Involuntarily, Penny's hand tightened on the reins, and Bones stopped. Louise pulled up so short that Whitefoot nearly reared back on her hind legs. A witch! Penny exclaimed half jubilantly, I've always wanted to meet one, and this is our chance. End of chapter 6 
Chapter 7 of Hoof Beats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 7 Bed and Board. For a moment, the two girls watched in awe the dark, grotesque figure silhouetted against the leaping flames of the fire. A woman in a long, flowing gown kept stirring the contents of the iron kettle. "'Doesn't she look exactly like a witch?' Penny exclaimed again. "'Maybe it's Mrs. Lear.' "'If that's the Lear place, I know one thing,' Louise announced dramatically. "'I'm going straight to Delta.' Penny knew better than to argue with her chum. Softly, she quoted from Macbeth double double toil and trouble fire burn and cauldron bubble trouble is all we've had since we started this wild trip louise broke in and now you ask me to spend the night with a witch not so loud or she may hear you penny cautioned don't be silly lou it's only a woman out in her backyard cooking supper at this time of night well it is a bit late but so are we any port in a storm come along louise i'll venture that whatever is cooking in that kettle will be good penny rode on and louise had no choice but to follow a hundred yards farther and they came to an ancient farmhouse set back from the road dismounting the girls tied their horses to an old-fashioned hitching rack near the sagging gate a mailbox bore the name mrs m j lear this is the place all right said penny just inside the gate stood an ancient domicile that by daylight was shaded by a giant sycamore built of small bricks it had latticed windows and a gabled front an iron weathercock perched on the curling shingle roof seemed to gaze saucily down at the girls going around the house to the back yard penny and louise again came within view of the blazing fire an old woman in a long black dress bent over the smoke-blackened kettle which hung from the iron crane hearing footsteps she glanced up alertly who is it she called and the crackling voice was sharp rather than friendly silas malcolm sent us here penny said moving into the arc of flickering light and who you be friends of his the hatchet-faced woman peered intently, almost suspiciously, at the two girls. Penny gave her name and Louise's, adding that they were seeking lodging for the night. We'll pay, of course, she added. The old woman scrutinized the girls for so long that they were certain she would send them away. But when she spoke, her voice was friendly. Well, well, she cackled. Anybody that's a friend of Silas is a friend of mine you're welcome to bed and board for as long as you want to stay penny thanked her and stepped closer to the kettle we've not had anything to eat since noon she said suggestively my whatever you're cooking looks good she sniffed at the steam arising from the iron pot and backed hastily away old mrs lear broke into cackling laughter <laughs> you cows don't want none of that this here is soap and i'm head over heels in it that's why i'm working so late soap repeated penny with deep respect why i thought soap was made in the factory mrs lear was pleased at the girl's interest most of it is she said but not my soap this here is homemade soap and i wouldn't trade a cake of it for all the store soap you can lug home not for heavy cleaning i wouldn't moving near enough to the fire to see the greasy mixture bubbling in the kettle penny asked mrs lear if she would explain how soap was made bless you yes the old woman replied with enthusiasm you are the first gal i ever ran across that was interested in anything as old-fashioned as soap making why when i was young every girl knew how to make soap and was proud of it but nowadays all the girls think about is gaddin and dancin and having dates with some worthless good-for-nothing come right up to the fire and i'll show you something about soap making mrs lear poked the glowing logs beneath the kettle first thing she explained is to get your fire good and hot 
Then you add your scrap grease. What is scrap grease? Louise asked, greatly intrigued. Well, bless you, child. That's the odds and ends of cooking that most folks throw away. Not me, though. I make soap of it. Even if it ain't so good smelling, it's a better soap than you can buy. The girls looked over the rim of the steaming kettle and saw a quantity of bubbling fats. With surprising dexterity for one of her age, Mrs. Lear inserted a long-handled, hoe-shaped paddle and stirred the mixture vigorously. Next thing you do is cook it in the lye, she instructed. Then you let it cool off and slice it to any size you want. This mess will soon be ready. And that's all there is to making soap, Penny said, a bit amazed in spite of herself. All oh, but a little elbow grease and some get up and get. Them two commodities is mighty scarce these days. While the girls watched, Mrs. Lear poured off the soap mixture. She would not allow them to help, lest they burn themselves. I can tell that you girls are all tuckered out, she said when the task was finished. Just put your horses in the barn and toss them some corn and hay. While you're gone, I'll clean up these soap-making things and start a mess of victuals cooking. Mrs. Lear waved a bony hand toward a large, unpainted outbuilding. Louise and Penny led their horses to it, opening the creaking old barn door somewhat cautiously. A sound they could not instantly identify greeted their ears. What was that? Louise whispered, holding back. Only a horse gnawing corn, Penny chuckled. Mrs. Lear must keep a steed of her own. It was dark in the barn, even with the doors left wide open. Groping their way to empty stalls, the girls unsaddled and tied the horses up for the night. Mrs. Lear's animal, they noted, was a high-spirited animal, evidently a thoroughbred. A riding horse, too, Penny remarked. Wonder how she can afford to keep it. Finding corn in the bin, the girls fed Bones and Whitefoot and forked them an ample supply of hay. Now to feed ourselves, Penny sighed as they left the barn. My stomach feels as empty as the Grand Canyon. The girls had visions of a bountiful supper cooked over the campfire. However, Mrs. Lear was putting out the glowing coals with a bucket of water. Come into the house, she urged. It won't take me long to get a meal knocked up. That is, if you aren't too particular. Anything suits us, Louise assured her. And the more of it, the better, Penny muttered, though under her breath. Mrs. Lear led the way to the house, advising the girls to wait at the door until she could light a kerosene lamp. By its ruddy glow, they saw a kitchen, very meagerly furnished with old-fashioned cook stove, a homemade table, and a few chairs. While you're washing up, I'll put on some victuals to cook, Mrs. Lear said, showing the girls a wash basin and pitcher. It won't take me a minute. With a speed that was amazing, the old lady lighted the cook stove and soon had a bed of glowing coals. She warmed up a pan of potatoes, fried salt pork, and hominy. From a pantry shelf, she brought wild grape jelly and a loaf of homemade bread. To complete the meal, she set before the girls a pitcher of milk and a great glass dish brimming with canned peaches. It ain't much, she apologized. Food never looked better. Penny declared, drawing a chair to the kitchen table. It's a marvelous supper, Louise added, her eyes fairly caressing the food. Mrs. Lear sat down at the table with the girls and seemed to take keen delight in watching them eat. Whenever their appetites lagged for an instant, she would pass them another dish. Now that you bet, tell me who you are and why you came, Mrs. Lear urged after the girls had finished. You say Silas sent you. Good food had stimulated Penny and Louise and made them in a talkative mood. They told of their long trip from Riverview, and almost before they realized it, had spoken of the headless horseman. Mrs. Lear listened attentively, her watery blue eyes dancing with interest. Suddenly, Penny cut her story short, conscious that the old lady deliberately was pumping her for information. So you'd like to collect Mr. Burmaster's reward? Mrs. Lear chuckled. We shouldn't mind, Penny admitted. 
Besides, we'd be doing the Burmasters a good turn to help them get rid of their ghost rider. That you would, agreed the old lady, exactly as if the Burmasters were her best friends. Yes, indeed, you've come in a good cause. Then perhaps you can help us, Louise said eagerly. You must have heard about the Headless Horseman. Mrs. Lear nodded brightly. Perhaps you know who the person is, Penny added. Maybe, maybe not, Mrs. Lear shrugged, and getting quickly up, began to carry the dishes to the sink. The firm tilt of her thin chin warned the girls that so far as she was concerned, the topic was closed. Rather baffled, Penny and Louise made a feeble attempt to reopen the conversation. Failing, they offered to wipe the dishes for their hostess. Oh, it ain't no bother to do em myself, Mrs. Lear said, shooing them away. You both look tired enough to drop. Just go up to the spare bedroom and slip beneath the covers. Louise and Penny needed no further urging. Carrying their knapsacks and a lamp Mrs. Lear gave them, they stumbled up the stairs. The spare bedroom was a huge, rather cold chamber, furnished with a giant four-poster bed and a chest of drawers. The only floor covering was a homemade rag rug. Louise quickly undressed and left Penny to blow out the light. The latter, moving to the latticed window, stood for a moment gazing out across the moonlit fields toward the Burmaster estate. "'Nothing makes sense about this trip,' she remarked. From the bed came a muffled, "'Now you're talking.' Ignoring the jibe, Penny resumed, "'Did you notice how Mrs. Lear acted just as if the Burmasters were her friends?' "'Perhaps she did that to throw us off the track. "'She asked us plenty of questions, but she didn't tell us one thing.' "'Yet she knows plenty. I'm convinced of that.' "'Oh, come to bed,' Louise pleaded, yawning. "'Can't you do your speculating in the morning?' "'With a laugh, Penny leaped into the very center of the bed, "'missing her chum's anatomy by inches. "'Soon Mrs. Lear came upstairs.' She tapped softly on the door and inquired if the girls had plenty of covers. Assured that they were comfortable, she went on down the hall to her own room. Worn from the long horseback ride, Louise fell asleep almost at once. Penny felt too excited to be drowsy. She lay staring up at the ceiling, reflecting upon the day's events. So far, the journey to the valley had netted little more than sore muscles. Yet there's mystery and intrigue here. I know it, Penny thought. If only I could get a little tangible information. An hour elapsed, and still the girl could not sleep. As she stirred restlessly, she heard Mrs. Lear's bedroom door softly creak. In the hallway, boards began to tremble. Penny stiffened, listening. Distinctly, she could hear someone tiptoeing past her door to the stairway. That must be Mrs. Lear, she thought. But what can she be doing up at this time of night? The question did not long remain unanswered. Boards squeaked steadily as the old lady descended the stairs. A little silence. Then Penny heard two long rings and a short one. Mrs. Lear is calling someone on her old-fashioned party-line telephone. She identified the sound. Mrs. Lear's squeaky voice carried clearly up the stairway through the half-open bedroom door. "'That you, Silas?' Penny heard her say. "'Well, those gals got here just as you said they would. First off, they asked me about the headless horseman.' A slight pause followed before Mrs. Lear added, "'Don't you worry none, Silas. Just count on me. They'll handle soft as kittens.' As she ended the telephone conversation, the old lady broke into cackling laughter. <laughs> End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016 Chapter 8 A Rich Man's Troubles Rain was drumming steadily on the roof when Penny awakened the next morning. Yawning sleepily, 
she sat up in bed. Beside her, Louise, curled into a tight ball, slumbered undisturbed. But not for long. Penny tickled an exposed foot until she opened her eyes. Get up, Lou, she ordered pleasantly. We've overslept. Oh, it's still night, Louise grumbled, trying to snuggle beneath the covers again. Penny stripped off all the blankets and pulled her chum from the bed. It's only so dark because it's raining, she explained. Anyway, I have something important to tell you. As the girls dressed in the cold bedroom, Penny told Louise about the telephone conversation she had heard the previous night. Mrs. Lear was talking to Silas Malcolm, I'm sure, she concluded. And about us, too. She said we'd handle very easily. Louise's eyes opened a trifle wider. Then you figure Silas Malcolm intended to get us here on purpose. I am beginning to think so. But why? Don't ask me, Penny said with a shrug. These valley folk aren't simple by any means. Unless we watch our step, they may take us for a merry ride. Not with the headless horseman, I hope, Louise chuckled. Why don't we just go home this morning and forget the whole silly affair? Penny shook her head. I'm sticking until I find out what's going on here, she announced. It might mean a story for Dad's paper. Oh, that's only your excuse, Louise teased. You know you could never resist a mystery, and this one certainly has baffling angles. The girls washed in a basin of cold water and then went downstairs. Mrs. Lear was making pancakes in the warm kitchen. She flipped one neatly as she reached with the other hand to remove the coffee pot from the stove. Good morning, she chirped. Did you sleep right last night? Penny and Louise agreed they had and edged closer to the stove for warmth. An old-fashioned clock on the mantel showed that it was only eight o'clock. But eight o'clock for Mrs. Lear was a late hour, judging by the amount of work she had done. A row of glass jars stood on the table, filled with canned peaches and plums. "'You haven't put all that fruit up this morning,' gasped Louise. Mrs. Lear admitted that she had. "'But that ain't much,' she added modestly. "'Only a bushel and a half. Won't hardly last no time at all.' Mrs. Lear cleared off the kitchen table, set it in a twinkling, and placed before the girls a huge mound of stacked cakes. "'Now you eat hearty,' she advised. I had mine hours ago. As Penny ate, she sought to draw a little information from the eccentric old woman. Deliberately, she brought up the subject of the Burmaster family. What is it you want to know? asked Mrs. Lear, smiling wisely. Why is Mrs. Burmaster so disliked in the community? Because she's a scheming troublemaker if ever there was one, the old lady replied promptly. Mr. Burmaster ain't so bad, only he's pulled around by the nose by that weeping, whining wife of his. Mrs. Burmaster seems to think that the valley folk treat her cruelly. She should talk about being cruel, Mrs. Lear's dark eyes flashed. You know what them Burmasters done? Only in a general way. Well, they come here and forced folks to get off the land. Didn't Mr. Burmaster pay for what he bought? Oh, it was done legal, Mrs. Lear admitted grudgingly. You see, most of this valley was owned by a man in the east. He rented it out in parcels and never bothered anyone, even if they was behind in their payments. Then Mr. Burmaster bought the entire tract of land from the eastern owners, inquired Penny. That's right. All except these here four acres were my house sets. They ain't nothing in this world that will get me in a mood to sell to that old skinflint. He's tried every trick in the bag already. Penny thoughtfully reached for another pancake. As an impartial judge, she could see that there was something to be said on both sides of the question. Mr. Burmaster had purchased his land legally and so could not be blamed for asking the former renters to move. Yet she sympathized with the farmers, who for so many years had considered the valley their own. This house of mine ain't much to look at, Mrs. Lear commented reflectively, but it's been home for a long time. Ain't nobody gonna get me out of here. You own your own land? inquired Louise. 
"That I do," nodded Mrs. Lear proudly. "I got the deed hid under my bed mattress." "Won't you tell us about Mr. Burmaster's difficulty with the Headless Horseman?" Penny urged, feeling that the old lady was in a talkative mood. "What do you want to know?" Mrs. Lear asked cautiously. "Is there really any such thing or is it just a story?" "If you girls stay in this valley long enough you'll learn for yourselves," Mrs. Lear chuckled. "I'll warrant you'll see that horseman." "And do you know who the horseman is?" Penny ventured daringly. "Maybe I do," Mrs. Lear admitted with a chuckle. "But a ten mule team couldn't pry it out of me and neither can you." Before Penny could resume the subject, chickens began to squawk and scamper in the barnyard. A large, expensive-looking car pulled up near the side door. Mrs. Lear peeped out of a window, and her jaw set in a firm, hard line. "'That's Mr. Burmaster now,' she announced in a stage whisper. "'Well, he ain't going to pressure me. No, sir. I'll give him as good as he sends.' After Mr. Burmaster pounded on the kitchen door, the old lady took her time before she let him in. "'Good morning,' he said brightly. "'Humph! What's good about it?' Mrs. Lear shot back. "'It's raining, ain't it? And if we get much more of it this fall, the dam up Huntley Way is going to let go sure as I'm standing here.' "'Ah, nonsense,' replied the estate owner impatiently. He stepped into the kitchen. Seeing Penny and Louise, he looked rather surprised and a trifle embarrassed. "'Oh, go on and say what you came to say,' Mrs. Lear encouraged. "'Don't stand on no ceremony just because I got city visitors.' Obviously, Mr. Burmaster did not like to speak before strangers, but there was no other way. "'You know why I'm here, Mrs. Lear,' he began. "'I've already made several offers for your property, and I've turned them all down.' "'Yes, but this time I hope you'll listen to reason. "'Last night my wife had a near collapse "'after a boy rode a horse across the bridge by our house. "'All this stupid talk about headless horsemen "'has inspired the community to do mischief. "'Now every boy in the valley is trying pranks.' "'And why not catch the horseman and put an end to it?' "'Mrs. Lear asked impudently. "'Nothing would please me better, but we've had no success.' My wife can't endure the strain much longer. It's driving her to a frenzy. I'm sorry about that, replied Mrs. Lear stonily. There ain't nothing I can do. I want you to sell this property, Mr. Burmaster pleaded. At least that will remove one irritation. You see, my wife considers the place an eyesore. She can see your house from our living room window. It ruins an otherwise perfect view of the valley. Now, ain't that too bad? Mrs. Lear's tone was sarcastic. Well, let me tell you something. That place of yourn spoils my view, too. I'm afraid I haven't made myself clear, Mr. Burmaster said hastily. It's a matter of my wife's health. Your wife ain't got no more ailing than I be, Mrs. Lear retorted. If she didn't have my house to bother her, it would be something else. I ain't going to sell, and that's all there is to it. You've not heard my offer. I'll give you $2,000 for this place. Cash. Mrs. Lear looked a trifle stunned. At the best, this place isn't worth 500 Mr. Burmaster resumed. But I aim to be generous. I won't sell, Mrs. Lear said firmly. Not at any price. Them's my final words. Mr. Burmaster had kept his voice carefully controlled, but the old lady's decision angered him. You'll regret this, he said in a harsh tone. I've been very patient, but I warn you, from now on I shall act in my own interests. Have you ever acted in any other? drawled a voice from behind the estate owner. Everyone turned quickly. Joe Quigley, the young station agent, stood framed in the open doorway. Smiling at Burmaster in a grim way, he came slowly into the kitchen. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 9 Straight from the Shoulder A silence had fallen upon those in the room. Joe Quigley shook raindrops from his overcoat. Deliberately, he took his time hanging the coat over a chair in front of the cook stove. Then, still smiling in an ironic way, he faced Burmaster. I repeat, he challenged, did you ever act in any manner except your own interest? You are insulting, insolent, Mr. Burmaster snapped. But I'll not be drawn into an argument with you. Good morning. Quigley blocked the door. Not so fast, he drawled. Matter of fact, I was on my way to your house. Saw your car standing in Mrs. Lear's yard, so I figured you were here. If you have a telegram for me, I'll take it. The only message I have is a verbal one, answered Quigley. A mayor from Delta, Bradley Mason, asked me to talk to you about the Huntley Dam. The subject does not interest me. It should interest every man, woman, and child in this valley, Quigley retorted. If the dam gives way, floodwaters will sweep straight down the valley. Your house will be destroyed before you ever knew there was any danger. Really, Mr. Burmaster's smile was a sneer. Let me worry about my own property. As a matter of record, I don't lose any sleep over you, Quigley responded heatedly. But I'm thinking about Mrs. Lear and the people living in Delta not to mention the towns on down the line which would be in the direct path of the flood if the good people of delta are endangered why don't they repair the dam themselves for the reason that we can't raise the money we've tried then the state should act in the matter i'm willing to write my senator repairs are needed now not three months from now mr burmaster you have the money, and you'd be doing the community a great service to lend help. We're not asking for a donation. It's as much to your interest as ours to protect the valley. There's no danger, Burmaster said angrily. Not a particle. It's only a scheme to shake me down for money. Brushing past the station agent, the man went out into the rain. In driving out of the yard, he turned the car so sharply that it skidded on its wheels. Well, that's that, Quigley remarked with a shrug. I should have saved my breath. I'm glad he's gone, Mrs. Lear announced tartly. Will you have a bite of breakfast, Joe? No, thanks, the young station agent replied. I'm due for my trick at the depot in twenty minutes. Have to run along. The girls were sorry to see Joe Quigley go so soon, for they had hoped to have a long talk with him. After he had disappeared into the rain, they tried, without much success, to draw more information from Mrs. Lear. The old lady was in no mood to discuss the Burmasters, but she did have a great deal to say about the flood danger to the valley. "'Tain't usual that we have so much rain,' she declared. Not at this time of year. Old Red River's flooding to the brim and keeps pouring more and more into the Huntley Lake Basin. The dam there was built years ago, and it wasn't much to brag on from the start. Haven't the authorities inspected the dam recently? Penny inquired thoughtfully. Oh, some young whippersnapper came here a month ago and took a quick look and said the dam would hold, Mrs. Lear replied, tossing her head. But he ain't living in the valley. We want repairs made, and we want them quick, not next year. Since Mr. Burmaster refuses to help, is there nothing that can be done? Oh, there's some as think that a little piece in the city paper might help, Mrs. Lear said, giving Penny a quick, shrewd glance. Your pa is a newspaper owner, ain't he? Yes, he owns the Riverview Star. Penny gazed across the table at Louise. It struck both girls that Mrs. Lear was very well informed about their affairs. How had the old lady learned that Mr. Parker was a newspaper man, if not from Silas Malcolm? More than ever, Penny was convinced that she had been lured to Red Valley, 
perhaps for the purpose of interesting her famous father in the Huntley Dam project. "'You've been very kind, Mrs. Lear,' she said, abruptly arising from the table. "'Louise and I appreciate your hospitality. However, we want to pay for our room and meals before we go.' "'You don't owe me a penny,' the old lady laughed. "'Furthermore, you ain't leaving yet. We must. There's an afternoon train, and there'll be another along tomorrow.' Why, you'd catch your death of cold riding hoss back all the way to Hobostein. The rain should let up soon. It should, but it won't, Mrs. Lear declared. Why don't you stay until tomorrow, anyhow? Then you could go down to the barn dance tonight at Silas's place. At the moment, the girls were not greatly intrigued at the prospect of attending a barn dance. The steady rain had depressed them. Though the long journey to Red Valley had proven interesting, it scarcely seemed worth the exhausting effort. They had learned very little about the so-called headless horsemen and doubted that any truly valuable information would come their way. If you stay over, maybe you'll get a chance to see that hoss-riding ghost, Mrs. Lear said slyly. Seems like it's mostly on bad nights that he does his prowling. The girls helped with the dishes, they made the bed and watched Mrs. Lear sew on a rag rug. At intervals, they wandered to the windows. Rain fell steadily, showing not the slightest sign of a let-up. "'Didn't I tell you?' Mrs. Lear said gleefully. "'It's a settling for a good, healthy poor. You might just as well calculate on staying another night.' "'But our parents will be expecting us home,' Louise protested. "'Send them a wire from Delta,' Mrs. Lear urged. "'Reckon this rain will sack in a bit come afternoon.' Throughout the long morning, Louise and Penny wandered restlessly about the house. Now and then, they sought, without success, to draw information from Mrs. Lear about the mysterious prankster. From the merry twinkle in her eyes, they were convinced she knew a great deal. Pry it from her, they could not. Maybe that headless horseman ain't nobody human, she chuckled. Maybe it's a real haunt. I mind the time somebody witched my cow. The stubborn critter didn't give no milk for eight days steady. Penny and Louise weren't sure whether the old lady was serious or trying to tease them. After a while, they gave up attempting to solve such an enigma. By noon, they had reconciled themselves to staying another night at Red Valley. However, scarcely had they made their decision to remain than the sky cleared. "'We're stuck here anyway,' Penny sighed. "'We couldn't possibly ride our horses back to Hobostein in time to catch the afternoon train.' After luncheon, the girls hiked across fields to the picturesque little town of Delta, there, they dropped in at the depot to chat with Joe Quigley and to send a telegram to their parents. If time's heavy on your hands, why not take a little jaunt to the Huntley Dam? The station agent suggested. It should be well worth your time. Penny and Louise decided to do just that. At Mrs. Lear's once more, they saddled their horses and took the pike road to a well-marked trail which led up into the hills. Ditches were brimming with fast-running water, yet there was no other evidence of flood. "'Do you suppose all this talk about the dam being weak is just talk?' Penny speculated as they rode along. "'In case of real danger, one would think state authorities would step into the picture.' Soon the girls came to the winding Red River. Swollen by the fall rains, the current raced madly over rocks and stones. The roar of rushing water warned them that they were close to the dam. In another moment, they glimpsed a mighty torrent of water pouring in a silvery-white ribbon over the high barrier. Men could be seen working doggedly as they piled sandbag upon sandbag to strengthen the weakened structure. Suddenly, Penny noticed a man and a woman who wore raincoats watching the workmen. Oh, there's Mr. and Mrs. Burmaster, she exclaimed. They rode closer to the dam. Mr. and Mrs. Burmaster were talking so earnestly together that they did not observe the newcomers. The roar of water drowned the sound of hoofbeats. 
but the wind blew directly toward the girls. Mrs. Burmaster's voice, shrill and angrily, came to them clearly. "'You can't do it, John! I won't allow it!' she admonished her husband. "'You're not to give the people of this valley one penny. The dam is perfectly safe.' "'I'm not so sure,' he said, pointing to the far side of the structure. As he spoke, a tiny portion of the dam seemed to melt away. The girls, watching tensely, saw several sandbags swept over the brink. Workmen raced to repair the damage. Mrs. Burmaster seemed stunned by the sight, but only for an instant. "'I don't care!' she cried. "'Not one penny of our money goes into this dam. It will hold. Anyway, I'd rather drown than be bested by that hateful old Lady Lear.' "'But, Matilda, don't speak to me of it again. Get her out of this valley, tear down her shack. If you don't, I warn you, I'll take matters into my own hands.' Turning abruptly, Mrs. Burmaster walked angrily down the trail. End of chapter 9